talk to you about uh, predator thresholds, as Isadora mentioned. And, uh, you know, I subtitled it even more helpful than you think. And I, maybe I should have said even more helpful than I think, because I've uh, learned a lot in the last couple of years that we've been deploying these. Uh, and what I learned is perhaps the initial guidelines we put out are um, perhaps a little too conservative. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm going to show you some evidence that maybe they're, these work even better than we had hoped and more consistent with the initial research that we used to develop them. Well, since we completed this work um, several years ago, and, and um, as part of one of my PhD students, um, a PhD project, Tim Vandervoet, um, we now can tell you that there are six groups, as uh, Isadora mentioned, the crab spiders, big eye bugs, minute pirate bugs, green lacewing larvae, trapezius flies, and colops beetles. So there may be two dozen species running around in your field, but these are the ones you need to really pay attention to because they are the ones we've shown through research that are uh, more directly related to um, whitefly biological control. Indeed, they're all generalist predators. And our previous research was on whiteflies only, but very likely these play a significant role in uh, the management of all secondary pests, whether those are mites or thrips or aphids or mealybugs or even salt marsh caterpillar. Um, but they're also probably assisting in ligus control too. But ultimately we produced eight independent predator thresholds. And by independent timing, mean you can focus on any one of these uh, predators in the deployment of four thresholds that are based on large nymphs or four other thresholds based on uh, um, white fly adults. Um, they work independently. So if any one of them suggests that biocontrol is functioning well in your field, then that's, that's all the information you need. You don't actually have to deploy all eight of these thresholds. You just have to have an idea of which ones are influential at any given time or place. Now, what does that mean to your industry? Well, it means a, a, a little more attention is paid to these beneficials. And luckily, we're using the tools you already use. Uh, you're out there measuring white flies. You should be out there with a sweep net and measuring ligus routinely. And as part of your ligus sweeps, you should now be able to count the predators that are present in those uh, sweep counts. So all of our recommendations are based on a per hundred sweeps basis and involve the numbers of these six predator groups. We distributed uh, laminated guides uh, with the help of industry a couple of years ago. If you don't have one of these in your possession or in the truck with you, let us know. It, it's a, it boils the whole program down uh, to this card that you can uh, look up on these tables and, and figure out what the critical numbers are. But it it, ultimately, it's just this application of these two tools, right? You're measuring your white flies on a per leaf, or in this case, a per disc basis for your uh, immatures. And you're measuring your predators as part of your ligus sweeps. And in this example, I've got two co-ops in 100 sweeps, and I only have one large nymph per disc, which is our, th our conventional threshold. That two to one is, is sufficient to defer that spray. Uh, that's basically how it works. Now, you need to keep track of uh, or, or pay attention to multiple predators out there. So we've provided tables that give you uh, the white fly densities and then the predator densities that you need to continue deferring a spray. So anything in this green zone, uh, if you have numbers that exceed, equal or exceed that, you can continue deferring a spray. I mentioned earlier that those were conservative guidelines, and I expect we're going to revise this table, not by changing any of these numbers, but expanding the green zone into higher white fly densities, because it really looks like this works, um, as the research told us originally, works at even higher white fly densities. Uh, when we rolled it out, I was more conservative. I wanted to make sure that we were never putting your decision making in jeopardy. Uh, or putting you at risk of making an incorrect decision. So we kept it very conservative, but I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, put out to you even more detailed tables that go to higher densities. But here's how it works. You have uh, your pest density and it can range from low to high. We have a threshold and whenever you're above threshold, you're gonna spray. Anytime you're below threshold, you don't need to spray. That's sort of like IPM 101 and you guys know that 
um, by heart. Uh, and you know also that you don't have to be measuring life wise every time you go to the field. There's going to be many times when they're too low to even initiate a sampling bout. And they're going to be the occasional times when a field gets away from you or there's been a mass migration, say, from a releasing adjacent host that you just know you got to get in there and spray because they're, they're way too high. You know, those aren't the situations where you need to be tracking predators. Um, but these other areas at or near the, the threshold, yeah, you, you should pay attention to the predators. They can help you make a more confident decision. So on the x-axis, I've added the predators there on the bottom, and they range from low to high. And because it's a predator to prey ratio, that forms this line that relates the two densities. And it creates these four different areas. The original spray zone is now a little bit smaller, but it's still there. The don't spray zone is still there. But then you end up with these triangular areas where, you know what, the, the, the white flies are above threshold, the conventional threshold, but I also have high predators. We now know through this research that that's still okay. You can, you can safely defer your spray and resample in the, in the coming um, sampling bout. So it gives you additional time to respond. And of course, anytime you can defer a spray, there's an opportunity that you might not, might not have to spray into the future. Equally important, however, and, and PCAs used to remind me that sometimes um, this works better, uh, you know, at a lower threshold. Well, and I'd say, well, no, the threshold's good. Probably what's happened is you didn't have enough predators present. And so, yeah, if, you're, if you've got uh, le Wi-Fi levels that are below the conventional threshold, but you haven't got many um, predators, then you're gonna have to advance the spray ahead of your normal threshold. Um, so it really helps you make a more confident decision. Let's walk you through. If we just assume this is the 40% line and we got 47% infestation of white flies, uh, that's over threshold. We don't have enough spiders to mitigate that. That's a spray situation. You got a spray. Here you got very low numbers of white flies and you also have high predator counts spiders in this case, just as one example, no need to spray. But here you're approaching threshold, you're below it. And in the past we'd say, oh, you probably don't need to spray, but now you notice that your predators are also very low. That's a situation where you need to advance a spray or you're gonna risk loss, you're gonna risk economic injury. And then there's this final quadrant where you're over the standard threshold, you're more than 40% infested, but you also have quite a few crab spiders, enough to mitigate that level. That's a situation where you can defer. Now that's in two dimensions. We can add a third dimension into two dimensions, which is each time you walk out there. So here's the first time I go out. Here's the second time I go out, third time, fourth time, fifth time. And whoops, sorry about that. Um, well, you know, on my third bout, I ended up here in the spray zone, uh, but I didn't spray. That's because I, I, this is just a chart of minute pirate bugs. I actually had access to seven other thresholds and five other predators to consider. And because I had access to that additional information, I did not spray. And, and in fact, I didn't have to. The next week I was fine. The week after that, I was fine. But what I end up with is something like this, something that looks very complex. It is complex. We're looking at ecology and action here. And I'm not suggesting you guys need to chart this out in order to understand it, but I want you to see that, yeah, these are independent thresholds. And whereas lace wings didn't really perform very well for me, uh, you know, crab spiders always kept us in the don't spray area. So, you know, this was a situation where we could continue to defer and continue to defer because one of our thresholds was being satisfied. So think of it as picking the right tool for your situation. You always need to be measuring your Wi-Fi densities when they're at or near threshold, a conventional threshold. But now you have eight predator thresholds to select among. And there may be times where you go out there and it's the colops beetles that are really out there in abundance and you're tracking them and they tell you, you know, you don't need to spray, um, then go ahead and just count the colops. But there might be another date you go out there and it's the crab spiders that are important. They're there in great abundance. Get a count on those and see how it, 
it, what it's telling you about the biocontrol potential in your field. So it's not necessary to track all eight of these thresholds at all times, like the charts showed you. You just have to be tracking those things that are most important in your field. And that changes from sample date to sample date. Here are your adult white flies per leaf. And I'm now charting this as our threshold line, the zero line. And then the, the line below it is sort of the beginning of the threshold. You know, all these thresholds represent a zone with some amount of uncertainty. And anytime you're within this area, you, you're really being challenged to make that call. And this is very real. You guys are in the field and you have to make that call. Is this the time to spray or not? Uh, but now we have biocontrol potential measured here and depicted just for minute pirate bugs. And right here, I have an excess of biocontrol. In other words, I have more than enough pirate bugs to suppress this level of white flies, no need to spray. But here I have a deficit. I don't have enough pirate bugs to hold back this level of white flies. So what do you do? Well, uh, hopefully it's very obvious to you guys. You've reached threshold. You don't have enough pirate bugs. Absent any other information, you're gonna go ahead and spray under those conditions. Well, that may be true, but we also have the other predators to consider. So let's walk you through the entire decision-making on this field that we were managing. You know, we, we crested into this zone multiple times, but lacewings were, lacewing larvae were never there in enough abundance uh, to control those white flies, except right here when they were below threshold. So there were actually eight times when uh, when we were in the threshold zone. And again, absent any other information, uh, those would be spray situations potentially. And so eight of eight times we would say, yeah, you, you need to spray. We overlay our Drapetus flies. They were abundant early, they were abundant later, but they didn't really help when we needed them, when, they, when we had to make these decisions. So still eight out of eight times we'd spray. Put the pirate bugs in there, the full season of them, we could say they, they got into great abundance here. So they helped knock out two of those sprays. So only, only six out of eight times now we would have recommended a spray. Put crab spiders in there and man, you get a different picture, right? They were there in huge abundance, so much so that they were helping us suppress these populations. And that's reflected in the patterns. Look at the seesaw battle that happens all through the season. Uh, that's because it's a it's a constant battle between predators and prey. But one time and one time only, we did not have enough of these predators to control white flies. And in fact, that's when we decided to make that spray in that predator threshold treatment. So let's uh, review another example of showing you how this works. Um, I struggle to make this meaningful for you guys, but you guys know um, what it's like scouting cotton. And these are from my trials. So this is last year's trial with two rates of a sale, a couple of experimental materials, two rates of Oberon, PQZ, Sivanto Prime, and then our untreated check. We did disrupt with acephate twice prior to, the, um, prior to these tracings. And in fact, all these got sprayed with acephate. That's why we had white flies in this trial, quite frankly. And we sprayed about 12 to 14 days prior to these tracings of large nymph densities. So we sprayed you know, earlier in the season, almost two weeks prior. And now this is again, real life. You've put out your sale, you've put out your Oberon, your PQZ, your Sivanto, you're out two weeks and you're, okay, how am I doing? Is this thing returning to threshold level? Do I need to spray? So let's look at that threshold. It's right here at one large nymph per disc. We're on a logarithmic scale, by the way. So this is tenfold higher up here. And here's a zone of uncertainty. This is a zone of concern around the economic threshold. And you can see this is the number of times that the assail treatment reached that zone. Twice here, three times here, one, four, and so forth. So you know, it, it was worst here in the untreated check. We were never out of that zone. You know, once we disrupted and didn't come in with a, a white fly spray, we were always um, at or above threshold. Now, why do we spray on threshold? Well, that's pretty obvious to you guys too. You're trying to prevent economic injury and we call that the economic injury level. That's here in pink. And the whole idea is you're making these sprays in order to prevent economic injury. So anything that gets into that injury level is and stays there for a sustained period will in fact be at risk of quality or yield loss. And that's where we were on this treatment twice. And of course, that's where we were in our untreated check. So 
what's the biocontrol doing in here? We wanted to follow this in, in years past when I was running these trials, every time I hit that threshold, I'd go ahead and spray. And so you might hear me telling the people I sprayed a sale twice or I sp sprayed Oberon three times. This year we said, nope, we're gonna follow the guidelines. What's the maximum biocontrol that's possible? Well, this is just charting that maximum biocontrol possible in how many nymphs per disc could be controlled. So anytime this blue line floats above the red line, we know there's more than enough biocontrol to suppress this level of white flies. So, wow, you know, what an outcome. It looks great. We got happy face everywhere across the board. The only place where we don't is here, where we already were experiencing economic injury. That's why I didn't give it a happy face. And in fact, we sprayed this product three times and still got this unhappy result. And the untreated check, of course, was sustaining some damage too. But this works and it works um, extremely well. And at densities even higher than I was willing to, to test before. So why is that important? Well, we want you to make a better decision. That's what your industry is all about. It's about providing the best possible decisions to your growers. Um, and, and what we did is we worked with Arizona PCAs, Mexican PCAs, and then we looked through our historical trial work for many years. A uh, majority of the time, it led to deferrals. Uh, more than half the time, the decision that was made by the PCA based just on uh, white fly densities was changed to a deferral, meaning they could have continued to defer. They could have waited a little longer before they sprayed. And that is a good outcome because more deferrals leads to more chances for natural mortality. And more chances for natural mortality mean more chances that you might not have to ever spray or respray the situation. And weather is a big part of that. Haboobs float through our landscape. They, are, uh, they can scour the leaf surface and literally remove white flies from them if they're powerful enough. Now you can't count on that on every field and every location, but you know each, each day you can uh, delay or each sampling bout you can delay gives you an opportunity for these additional factors to contribute to mortality. Now we've talked about the success of our IPM program in the past, and I think I've shown data to you that shows that we've saved over a half billion dollars to the industry through your practice of, um, of, of your industry uh, since 1996. As part of that analysis, we could show even before we deployed these predator thresholds that 42% of that gain is really attributable to the biocontrol that's been enabled. You know, it's the deployment of all these selective technologies and then the biocontrol that's possible because of it. We think by now, rather than just passively accepting the biocontrol that happens, you, now you can actively manage it by tracking your predator levels uh, and making decisions with that additional piece of information. So where does that leave us? Uh, you know, I try to remind folks that we've made a heavy investment in selectivity in Arizona in a way that far exceeds anywhere else in the cotton belt and perhaps anywhere else in the world. What you guys are doing in the field here is extraordinary compared to what you might see in the Mid-South or Southeast or elsewhere. Uh, and that's in part because there's been this heavy investment in selectivity. But we always have to ask ourselves, are we getting full investment? Are we reaping the full investment out of, um, out of this uh, promise of selectivity? You know, there's been eradication of the bull weevil and the pink borm. Those are extraordinary achievements. We have LEP active traits in our cotton. We have lots of different selective chemistries, not just for white flies and ligus, but some of our other targets as well. And now you have the Thrive On trait, which is a selective trait for ligus and thrips control. You know, those are heavy, heavy investments, hundreds of millions of dollars invested in the development of these technologies. And you guys are stewarding their, their deployment out there. And, and that's great. That's great for IPM, it's great for growers, it's great for the bottom line. And it's protected best if you um, if you continue to do that and continue to scrutinize every broad spectrum input you make. I'm not arguing against broad spectrums. There's going to be pest targets for which we have no selective, selective technologies. But um, keeping in the forefront the idea that we really have to invest in these selective um, technologies to support the overall success um, should be front of mind. So I've uh, demonstrated for you what we call our biocontrol informed thresholds or predator thresholds. 
They are, um, they help us give you very specific guidance now, rather than just say, hey, you know, use uh, soft chemistry and preserve your, your natural enemies. We can now tell you which ones to pay attention to and at what levels are they effective.